Uh, hi, people. Tēnā uh, koutou katoa, ko McDuncan tuku ingoa no whanganui aho. So, um, thank you so much for having me here this morning. I want to share a little bit personally. It's always hard to do. I'm going to be a bit vulnerable. Um, I've just come off five days of lecturing down in the South Island, so I'm a bit weary, got in yesterday. Um, but hey, pity party is over. I got it. Yeah. Uh, in 1985, uh, I was married to a lady called Ruby, and uh, we, um, we had a nine month old and a uh, two year old. And we left the shores of New Zealand <coughs> and we went to live in the heart of the slums of Manila. So we did it in his name. I love the master in heaven. And in his name, we went to live with the very, very poor. So we lived in a plywood shack. We uh, had a plywood kind of corrugated iron kind of room. And if I put my little finger through our plywood room, it went into the room of people over here, and there were 16 in that room. And if I put the finger through here, there were 12 up there, 15 here. We had mud floor. The rats were as big as cats. And at nighttime, they fought with the snakes. Uh, there were just horrendous disease-carrying mosquitoes. There were cockroaches that would come into the room by their thousands just like a blanket and a wave. And so we, we did 10 years in that place. Um, but as I say, we took a, a nine-month-old baby and we took a two-year-old daughter, and her name is Emily. And it's her story that, in part, I want to share with you this morning. And then at the close of about nine years or thereabouts, I don't know, I acted very immaturely. And... Um, I had a disagreement, I was one of the leaders and I had a disagreement with some of the people in the organization. And um, I don't know, I just like a little kid in a sandpit, I picked up my toys and marched out and walked away. In other words, I basically said to this outfit and to these people, we'll stuff you, I'm out of here. And so I left and I let a lot of people, good people down. Uh, and I knew that as we were going to the airport that I was making a huge mistake. But my pride wouldn't let me go back and confess and admit to that. So we flew back here to uh, New Zealand and um, we went down to the lower hut and I wanted to see what gangland was like in the lower hut. So we intentionally moved into a pretty rough neighbourhood. Uh, but for about two years... I just knew that I'd made this horrendous mistake. And I don't know about you, when you've made a mistake, you kind of feel as though you're on the D team. And I felt that I was no longer on God's A team, but on the D team. And so I, um, I would sort of be there as a father, but not really. And then it, I'd make the meal at night times, and then I'd go into my bedroom, our bedroom, and I don't know, I just shut the door, closed the curtains, and I'd lie on, in a fetal position on the bed, and I'd just weep copious amounts of tears because of the, just the huge regret over making a big mistake that I had made. And at that point, our daughter, Emily, and I have her permission to tell her story from her, but at that point, she started to pull her eyebrows out and her eyelashes. And I... I didn't really engage with that. And then we, I got this call uh, to be a pastor in Australia. And so we went to Melbourne. And uh, about seven months into my tenureship of being a pastor in this church, it became known to me that the senior elder of this church was a practicing homosexual with a live-in partner. And when I found out, I went to the elders with this elder present. And I said, look, you know, I, I, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and then they kind of said, well, we've been waiting for you to find out. And I just still stood there, and then they said, what do you think? And uh, I, um, well, I haven't got time to share this story, 
But I went on a journey for about three months, kind of doing some hardcore research into complex human sexuality issues, stuff that I'd never really looked at before. That's why, I, I, you know, I, I, so I did this for three months. <laughs> and, um, but after, after this, you know, I just felt I should really resign. Uh, no, in all seriousness, I just felt, and it was one of the hardest decisions that I'd made, I'd, I've made, and I just felt the best thing for me to do would be to walk. Um, prior to walking, Emily, my daughter, she had had a dream. This was several months before. And in this dream, she, 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 in the dream, she saw Satan coming to destroy her. And so she carried that dream as we came back to New Zealand, actually here to Auckland. But by this time, she was starting to cut. And again, as a father, I didn't really, I didn't really engage with that. But she was cutting at this stage. So when she was about 13, 14 here in Auckland, she was going to Avondale High School. And um, she, in that year, uh, well, I should really tell you, actually, that when we did leave Melbourne, uh, and we came back to our kids in Melbourne and said, look, we're leaving, I think we should just leave. Um, they all burst into tears. And then that night, I got a letter from Emily. And she said in this letter, I hate you, and I hate your God. Because for her, this was, this was one shift too many in her little life. And so she said, I hate you, and I hate your God. So then we came back, and we came here to Auckland. And... Um, at the age of 14, she was attending school, but she became a truant, and she just wouldn't attend school at times. And then she was starting to smoke, and then she was starting to have sex with boys at the age of 14, 15. And, um, and then the following year, she was using heavy spirits and smoking marijuana. And then the following year, at age 16, I, I overheard my daughter having a conversation with her brother, and she was trying to get him hooked into drugs. And so I said to her, you know, like Ruby and I said to her, you know, we have house rules. You know, you cannot do this. I mean, we have to respect other people in this household. Well, she got so full of anger and rage at that point that she just stormed out of the house and she left for good. We did not ask her to leave, but she left. And, um, and then in the following year, um, this time she's age 17, she became a meth P ice addict and she started to take heavy class A drugs. And then the following years, she joined the gangs here in South Auckland. I'm um, not South Auckland, West Auckland. She joined the gangs, and they are just, just violent, filled environments. And at times, she would be battered and bruised and bouncing off, window, uh, bouncing off walls and through windows. And she was just, and she, and she was in the state of uh, serious uh, P. I. Smith addiction. At age about 21, she thought that she would try Christianity. You know, she thought that she would sort of become a Christian, but, but she knew and we knew that she wasn't doing this genuinely. She just wanted to use God. She just wanted to kind of co-opt God. She wanted to use God as a means to her ends. She had various uh, ends in her life, and she thought that this God could be the means to those ends. Well, it just doesn't work that way. And it didn't work for her. So she continued in her environment, and at age 23, she had an abortion. And I don't know if you've ever had a daughter that's had an abortion. It took me two years to get over that. 
And I don't think she will ever get over it. And then two years later, she had another abortion. And then I, I remember at the time we were living in Mangari Bridge and uh, she was at our place for dinner and um, she said, oh, Dad, can, you know, can I go out on the deck and light up? And I said, yeah, that's fine, that's cool. So she went out on the deck to have a cigarette and I joined her out on the deck and as we were on the deck, I kept seeing this kind of this this black spot in the horizon far away, and I thought, what the is that, you know? And it, and it moved, and, and it got closer and closer and closer, and, and then it, and it got larger and larger as it got closer, and then I began to see that it was a black helicopter. And then it came to our area, and then it hovered over our house. In other words, it was a police helicopter, and they had tracked her mobile. And uh, at that point, my daughter, she knew that she had to do a scarpa. You know, she had to do a run. She had to exit this country. And so, like all good criminals, she went to Australia. And... Uh, I, I like Australia, don't get me wrong. So she trucked on over to Australia and... Um, and uh, she just became a rough sleeper and she was just using and she was doing it. I mean, she had part-time jobs and so on. And then, and then one day, um, we got a phone call. We got this phone call from Emily and, um, and she said to us, she said, hey, mum, hey, dad, I, I think I'm an addict. And uh, I mean, you know what it's like? You can't tell an addict that they're an addict. They've got to tell themselves. I mean, there's a truth in that. And so she said, look, I think I'm an addict. And we said, okay, uh, <laughs> you know. And then she said, you know, maybe I need to do rehab. And we said, yeah, that could be a good idea, you know. Uh, and, um, and she said, then she said, you know, I'm working at the Crown Plaza and every time I come out of this hotel, there's this big banner and it's got rehab on it. And, um, and it seems as though it's some sort of Christian outfit. She said, maybe I should go there. That could be a good idea. Yep. Uh, and so she, um, she went and she went into rehab and she did about, um, I don't know, three months, I think. And then she started to use a minor Class C substance. And she got found out, so they kicked her out. And then they said, you can come back, but if you come back, you've got to humble yourself and you've got to start the program from the beginning again. And so she went back and she started all over again. And um, in there, she became a Christ follower. Uh, uh, she, became a, she became a disciple, a genuine disciple. And she did the entire program, stayed clean for the entire time. And then she just has this ability to work with really tough ladies. You know, I'm talking tough, tough ladies. And uh, so she became a head of one of their households. She did really well there. Then they put her in charge of being a manager of one of their campuses in Australia. And she did so well there that then she became the general manager of seven campuses throughout Australia, dealing with some hardcore people. Now, I wish I could zip the story up at that point, but I can't. So about three or four years ago, she... Uh, fell in love, uh, nice bloke, but three weeks before the wedding, she broke it off uh, because she had discovered that he had, he had been using something. So that broke her heart. And then uh, just last year, she, uh, you know, hooked up with someone else and good guy, Christian, and but just around about two and a half months ago, uh, they called it off. And so she is a woman with a broken heart. And so we were talking, you know, we, she would ring me up once a week, and we were talking on the phone one day about two and a half months ago, maybe less than that. And, you know, in her brokenness, she just, um, she got angry, as you do. And she just gave vent in this phone call. And she just blurted out, 
You know, she just said, oh, men and fathers. Men and fathers. And I said, what do you mean? And she just said, men and fathers. And I, I just felt really awkward. It was like she was, I don't know, reducing her situation, her problems, her past, partly to men, but also to fathers. And so we, you know, we finished the awkward phone call and, and uh, I sat in my chair and I thought, well, is she right? I mean, I didn't want to go there. I didn't want to ask this question. But I thought, is she right? I mean, am I a contributing factor in the stuff that she got involved in? I mean, do I carry some responsibility with what happened to my child? I mean, Paul, they've named this, this gathering of ours, it's not just promise keepers, but it's courage. And so I started to enter into a courageous conversation with myself. And everything welled up within me. I mean, it was like things screamed within, don't go there, Mick, don't do this to yourself, just kick it to touch. Don't do it. But there is a thing called courage. And I felt to have that courageous conversation with myself. And so then I began to reflect on what kind of father and what kind of man and what kind of person I had been through the decades. I mean, I turn 65 next year, so I'll have my pee party next year. Uh, but I started to reflect on my history. And you know, I will never forget when I became a Christ follower in Christchurch. You know, I, I, um, I got called into the office by the pastor. And he's a little short fella. And uh, he called me in and he said, sit down, Mick. And I sat down and he said, look, I'm going to have to be your truth teller today. And so I gripped the chair, you know. I, I was just new to this Christian stuff. And, and he said, look, he said, you know, we've had you up speaking and we've had you speaking here and speaking there. And, you know, for your public speaking, we'll give you, you know, seven, eight out of ten, you know, that kind of thing. And then he said, but for your relationships, for your, um, I don't know, for your relationships with others, he said, you're dead useless. Uh, he said, I'll give you zip, zero, nothing. I mean, and you know, I felt like giving him a bunch of Kiwi Five, you know, but, uh, but this is what he said. And as I walked from his office, I knew that he had spoken truth, that I was not good at interpersonal relationships. So I said to him later on, what do I do? And he said, oh, you, you need to, you know, go to a, a kind of a campus in Australia and you need to do 24-7, 365 with people. So there was this Bible college on a farm in Tasmania. So I, I trucked on over there and it was like doing time, you know, it was really hard. But, but it was really good for someone like me. And so I did those two years and I came back and prior to leaving, by the way, I had met this young girl and I liked her, couldn't get her out of my head while I did time overseas. And, and so I came, came back and I went straight to her place and I asked her to marry me. And um, she sort of didn't say anything. Uh, she hid her face in a cushion. Um, um, and uh, well, she was a bit wary of me and... Um, but eventually she said yes, and we got married. And it was hard. I mean, the first 12 years of our marriage, we argued horrendously. And I mean, after six weeks of marriage, she stormed out of the house and she said, you know, she'd made the biggest mistake in her life. And she screamed it to the neighbors for them to hear. And, uh, and, um, and I began to, I mean, I struggled in marriage, you know, like even in sexual activity. Um, 
You know, we would do the act. And then very soon afterwards, I would sort of creep into the corner of the bed. Um, I just could not do intimacy. I could not do emotional attachment. So my, my pastor said I was dead useless at relationships. I'd made some progress. But in marriage, I continued to struggle relationally. And, uh, and that lasted decades. And of course, Ruby, my wife, every time I kind of pulled back from her, she took it as a commentary on herself that I didn't like her. So you can imagine what it did to her. But actually, it wasn't a commentary on her. It was a commentary on me. There was something about me that struggled to emotionally connect with other people. And so, as I was having this courageous conversation with myself two and a half months ago, I reflected on that pastor. I reflected on Ruby in our early decades in marriage. And then I started to reflect on me and my kids and my bringing them up, especially through those first two decades. And I began to admit to myself, acknowledge to myself, that yes, for decades with them, I emotionally distanced myself from them. There was a gap between us. And I began to admit this to myself just two months ago or thereabouts. And so then I thought, well, what do I do? And so I contacted my eldest daughter. And I said, look, I need to have a courageous, I use this language, I need to have a courageous conversation with you. There is something that as your father, I need to acknowledge. And I said, I'm sorry, but I... I kept you at emotional distance from me as a father. And I need to know how you experience that. And so she told me how she experienced it. And she said, Dad, it was very confusing. I found it confusing. There was a part of me that desperately wanted your gaze. I desperately wanted your attention. And so I did all manner of things to get you to look at me. And she said, I tried and tried for years to get you looking at me. Oh, yeah, we did things together. We went holidaying together. We did this and that. But you can do all of that stuff. And yet still, in your heart of hearts, have this emotional distancing thing going on. And that was me. And so she said, Dad, for Years, I tried to get your attention. But then she said it got to a point where it was just too tiring and I just thought, stuff it, I'm going to stop it. And that was at that point that she started to turn towards other things. We had Promise Keepers two weeks ago in Wellington. And I shared the story down there. And I said to the crowd of guys, I said, straight after this session, I'm going to go and have a coffee with my son. And uh, so we had an hour and a half at a cafe. And I said to my son, I said, I've got something to acknowledge. And I told him what I'd said to Emily. And I said to him, how did you experience that? I mean, what was that like for you? And he said to me, in all honesty, you know, we both had tears down our cheeks. He said, I just grew up thinking that I don't matter. That's terrible. Why would I do that to one of my children? Why would I do it to my son? that he just grew up thinking that he didn't matter. That's terrible. And then just a week ago, I was in Christchurch, and my youngest daughter, who's now 31, uh, I caught up with her. And again, she found it so confusing. So, 
So there's this, every day now, I wake up with a sense of um, deep regret and sadness. And I wish that I could get that ground back again. I wish I could do time over again, but I can't. So I've got to finish soon, friends. Um, there is a passage in the Bible, and it's, you know, some of you may have read it, and it's the parable of the prodigal son. Who's read it? Um, it's in Luke's Gospel. And, you know, in, we have a situation there of a father, and he's got two sons, and one of the sons, as some of you know, he says to his dad, look, I want my inheritance or my share of it, and I'm just going to get out of here. And so he, he took his stuff, you know, and he went to a far off land, and he kind of misused, you know, the monies that he had and ended up being a rough sleeper and just slept and ate anything that he could and so forth and so on. And then we're told in the parable that in a sense, the father, he stood on the, you know, his house that was kind of an honoured person he was, which was up at top of a, a hill, and he just, you know, he must have be, looked out on the horizon for the return of his son. And then there was one particular day where he saw in the distance a shadow, and it moved, and he thought, maybe, maybe, surely, hopefully, and as that shadow got closer, he saw that it was his son. And you know what he did next, the father. He ran. Now, in that culture in the first century, you don't lift up your garments and you don't run for a person of status. That is a dishonorable thing to do. But he ran. And why did he run? Because in that culture, if the son that had dishonored the father walked towards the house through the village, the villagers took it upon themselves to beat up the son out of respect to the father that had been dishonored. And therefore, the father who knew this, the father ran, and he ran, and he ran towards his son. Why did he run? Because he wanted to get to the son before other things got to the son. He wanted to get to the son before the son was hurt by other things and people. So he ran. And friends, for decades, I didn't run towards my children. But I'm running now. I'm running. And it's hard. I feel so bad. And maybe I wasn't as bad as I'm sharing it with you. I don't know. It gets confusing. But I'm running towards my kids now. And there are some of you here, you've got to run. You've got to run to a daughter. And there's some of you here, you've got to run to an uncle. And there's some of you here, you've got to run to a grandfather. And there's some of you here, and you've got to run, run to your dad. And there are some of you here, you've got to run to your mum. You have family members in your extended, extended family. I say, be like the father that Jesus shared about. And be a runner. Be a runner. And run. And run. When you leave this gathering, you run. You have that courageous conversation with yourself. And if there's a family member that I don't know, for whatever reason, you just haven't been there for them, then you run towards them. Be vulnerable, be transparent, and humble yourself. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yeah, okay.
Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks, guys. Yeah. So uh, we're going to put some uh, slides up here. We're going to do a bit of work on stuff now. Um, have we got those up there? Could we have them? Well, I'll read from down here anyway. It's, we're going to do a bit of a group discussion. And um, if you've got a pen and paper, just to write down what God has been saying to you this morning, is there, I don't know, is there a hard time that you or someone in your family is going through and what can you do? Is there a hard time someone is going through um, and, and can you help in any way? Is there a child that, I don't know, you need to stop rescuing? It was, it, it was interesting with my daughter, by the way. You know, you're so tempted to rescue when you see your daughter being a rough sleeper on the streets. But we, we made a decision not to rescue, but we did make a decision to, at times, financially assist her. But we would only give monies for medicine and doctors, and not to her, but straight to the professional. So we didn't want to do a rescuing job with her. There was a sense in which we had to let Emily spiral down to the bottom of the hole. And it's so good when someone, I mean, it's hard, but they spiral down to the bottom of the hole. And then you know what Jesus done? Jesus does. He climbs down into the hole. And he gets to the bottom of the hole. And then he says to the person at the bottom of the hole, are you ready? Are you ready? And it's like how Emily says, ready for what? And Jesus said, me. Are you ready for me? I can start where you start. And that's, of course, what happened to our family member. So have you got a family member? I mean, I've shared really vulnerably with you. So how about you start sharing vulnerably with yourself and write a few things on your bit of paper. If you could take a few minutes to do that, that'd be great. 